Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. I came across this post on X from Sprinter. It says, presenter of the 12th channel of Israel. Israel fears that Hezbollah's response to the killing of Hania and Shukar will be to recapture the Golan Heights through ground operations. And I thought that that was pretty interesting. And this is something that I've been wondering um, ever since this all went down. Uh, is it possible that things will escalate to the point where we see a ground invasion of Israel, right? Here's the Golan Heights right here. And then you have this map that shows all these uh, Iranian positions in Syria, as well as Russian positions. And, um, you know, initially I, I do expect that it would just be a missile and a uh, drone attack, but depending on Israel's response or depending on how strong the attack is and what their plans are, could it escalate to the point where we see an invasion of Israel? Now, this map looks looks pretty dramatic. Uh, I wanted to find where Sprinter was getting this from. And thankfully, in the bottom right, it says that it comes from Jusor Center for Studies. And so I went to that website. And uh, it looks like it's something similar to the Institute for the Study of War. And they have this map. Uh, called Map of Foreign Forces Military Sites in Syria, mid-2024. I have it pulled up in a different tab so we can look at it closer. And uh, hopefully you already know that Syria has been in a state of civil war ever since the Arab Spring in 2012. And, um, you know, you have all these, you know, foreign uh, forces that are in Syria to try and stabilize the situation. Uh, for a while, you did have a very large presence of ISIS, but they are essentially now non-existent. And according to this map, you have, you know, Turkey in the north. You have Iran and Russia all throughout the country. And then you also have uh, U.S. military installations in Syria as well, because we've been operating there. And so in uh, the very southwest of the country, bordering Israel, uh, you have a, a pretty large cluster of, um, you know, military positions. And you can see over here in the key, uh, these are uh, quote unquote stationing sites. So it's not like this is a recent development, but it seems like Iran is pretty well established in that part of the country. And so maybe it wouldn't be too difficult to stage an invasion. Uh, I have no idea. We are talking about Hezbollah, but uh, they are essentially, you know, they answer to Iran and coordinate with Iran. And so they could very easily use these sites. I don't know how things would go. I'm not a military expert, but um, I'm curious to see if things might go that way. If things continue to escalate, uh, would they try and take the goal on heights? Would they try and go further? Would they try and uh, respond to Hamas's call to completely destroy Israel? Is that the master plan? That's something that I've wondered this entire time, ever since the war started on October 7th. Is there actually a master plan uh, at play? Or was Hamas just really foolish and decided to uh, go it alone and hope that others would join in? I, I kind of doubt that that's the case. I still don't think that that's the case. So let's just do a quick reminder um, or a, qu a quick uh, review of Armageddon. Okay. So we're looking at the Institute student manual. It says some 60, sorry, some 60 air miles north of Jerusalem lies the ancient city of Megiddo now called Tel El Met uh, Metusalem. In its north central Palestinian location, Megiddo overlooks the great plain of Cedralon, an area of some 20 by 14 miles in which many great battles took place anciently. Megiddo is the older Hebrew form of Armageddon, or Har Megiddon, meaning the mount or hill of Megiddo, or the hill of battles. It is the valley of Megiddon, mentioned in Zechariah 12, 11. At the very moment of the second coming of our Lord, all nations shall be gathered against Jerusalem to battle. And the battle of, of, of Armageddon obviously covering the entire area from Jerusalem to Megiddo, and perhaps more, will be in progress. As John expressed it, 
the kings of the earth and of the whole world will be gathered to the battle of the great day of God Almighty into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Then Christ will come as a thief, meaning unexpectedly, and the dramatic upheavals promised to accompany his return will take place. It is incident to this battle of Armageddon that the supper of the great God shall take place, and it is the same battle described by Ezekiel as the war with Gog and Magog. Okay, so let's take a look at the map, and uh, here's Megiddo right here in the north of Israel, uh, not too far from Nazareth, and um, here's Jerusalem down here. So with what we just read, it was saying that it was obvious that Armageddon would take place uh, between, at the very least, between these two sites right here and more. And I think that it's pretty safe to assume that if there's an invasion of Israel and Megiddo is like the central point or maybe the starting point, um, well, it wouldn't really be the, st the starting point because either forces would have to come here from the Mediterranean or from the north. Um, so it doesn't seem like anything would be coming necessarily from the south when we're talking about that specific battle. Uh, if we zoom out, you can see Egypt uh, in the west, and then you have Jordan east of Israel. And uh, the only other countries that border Israel are in the north, Syria right here, and then Lebanon. And then you have the Golan Heights, which was taken from Syria as a result of Israel's victory in the Six-Day War. And um, it's a disputed area. Syria wants it back, right? But it seems to me if there was some kind of invasion of Israel led by Iran, that it probably would come through the north. Um, because uh, Jordan, you know, uh, is not under the influence of Iran. It's it, Jordan isn't part of the axis of resistance. And uh, if anything, uh, it seems like they're going to help, uh, as things are right now, uh, they're going to help defend Israel. Uh, when we had this, la this last attack from Iran in April, uh, you had all these uh, different missiles, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles coming from Iran and crossing over into Jordanian airspace, and Jordan helped shoot them down. And it seems like that'll be the case this time as well. So... It's not like Iran over here, if they were to try and do a land invasion, I don't think that they would come through Saudi Arabia or Jordan in order to do that. They would have to go through Syria and Lebanon, which is where they have influence in the first place. So it feels like things are kind of shaping up to um, go that way. The question is, with what we're expecting here, uh, pretty soon with this attack, is it going to lead to that? And uh, only time will tell. But uh, as we saw on that map, Iran already has a lot of, you know, um, positions. And uh, I, I don't know the full extent of, extent of it, uh, but they have what seems like forward operating bases uh, right here on the border with Israel in the Golan Heights. Okay. So... We'll have to wait and see. And as I was thinking about this post, it reminded me of this story. Uh, I'm just looking at this article from Times of Israel. Hamas official says group aims to repeat October 7th onslaught many times to destroy Israel. So now, granted, this is Hamas, but if they're speaking not just for themselves, but for the grand master plan, if there is one, then, um, well... The attack of October 7th, it was a ground operation, right? It was it was essentially a, a, a small, not so much uh, invasion, but I guess incursion into Israeli territory. But is this part of the, the grand master plan, more ground operations? So let's just read this really quick. A senior member of Hamas has hailed the systematic slaughter of civilians on Israel on October 7th, vowing in an interview that if given the chance, the Palestinian terror group will repeat similar assaults many times in the future until Israel is exterminated. In the interview, Hamid said that Israel's existence is quote-unquote illogical 
and that it must be wiped off all all quote unquote Palestinian lands, a term the terror group uses to mean the West Bank, Gaza, and Israel minus the Golan Heights. When asked whether this meant the complete annihilation of Israel, Hamas replied, "Yes, of course. We must teach Israel a lesson, and we will do it twice and three times. The Al Aqsa Deluge, or Al Aqsa Flood, Al Aqsa Storm. It's had a, you know it goes by a couple different variations on the name. Uh, the name of Hamas, the name Hamas gave its October seventh onslaught, is just the first time, and there will be a second, a third, a fourth." Hamid continued, um, will we have to pay a, sorry, will we have to pay a price? Yes, and we are ready to pay it. We are called a nation of martyrs, and we are proud to sacrifice martyrs. So I think that that's all that I had from this. So I don't know. We'll we'll just have to wait and see, but I wouldn't be surprised if things eventually go that way. Um they go toward more ground operations and and probably beyond just the Golan Heights, especially if like if they're really successful in their attack or they feel that Israel is really weak, then maybe they'll just go for it. Um, I do have a few more things. This is from Jerusalem Post. This was published today. Iran, Hezbollah to deliberately target civilians in response to Shukr assassination. The permanent mission of the Islamic Republic of Iran to the United Nations told CBS News in an exclusive on Friday that the Iran-backed terror group Hezbollah would begin deliberately targeting Israeli civilians, claiming that it had not done so until now. Hezbollah has reportedly decided to increase its targets in attacks in response to the assassination of its commander, Fuad Shukr. Quote, until now, Hezbollah and the regime have... Uh, in an unwritten understanding, practically adhered to certain limits in their military operations, meaning that confining their actions to border areas in shallow zones, targeting primarily military objectives, a spokesperson for the delegation told CBS. However, the regime's attack on uh, Daia in, Re- in Beirut and the targeting of a residential building marked a uh, deviation from these boundaries We anticipate that in its response, Hezbollah will choose both broader and deeper targets and will not restrict itself solely to military targets and means. So we'll have to wait and see if that's the case. And then I saw this from U.S. Civil Defense News. Update, Iran has publicly announced for the first time that it has nuclear weapons. Uh, Quote, we have obtained nuclear weapons, but we do not announce it. End quote. Iranian politician Ahmed Ardistani. Um, well, th- okay. <laughs> um, this uh, this is a little bit uh, misleading. Not not exactly correct. Um, I've seen a few posts repeating this today on X, and it seems to be coming from this article. There might be other ones, but this is Jewish News Syndicate. Iranian lawmaker, we might already have a nuclear bomb. And this was posted back in May of, of this year, May 13th. But it is something to consider. It says, Iran might already possess a nuclear bomb, a, law, a lawmaker close to the regime said over the weekend amid public threats by officials in Tehran to weaponize the country's atomic program, Iran International reported. Ahmed Bakshayesh Ardistani who has served in government in various capacities since the early 1980s and now represents a district close to the Natanz nuclear facility, told the state-run Roy Dodd 24 outlet that Tehran took the risk of attacking Israel in April due to Iran's possession of nuclear weapons. Now, if that's true, that's really interesting that that's why they felt they could do that because they already have nuclear weapons. And, uh, there are so many times that I've seen Netanyahu and others say, you know, Iran is, you know, X number of weeks or X number of months away from developing um, or at least like producing uranium that could be used for a nuclear bomb. And it's been a while since I've heard anyone say that. So if that's true, I think at this point they at least have the uranium. I know that there's been the question of whether they can actually weaponize it whether they can actually produce the delivery system for a nuclear uh, weapon, because that's a whole other, that's a different thing from, uh, in you know, 
producing the the uranium for it. So, I don't know, but let's continue. Quote, in my opinion, okay, here's the actual quote. In my opinion, we have achieved nuclear weapons, but we do not announce it. It means our policy is to possess nuclear bombs, but our declared policy is currently within the framework of the JCPOA, uh, the 2015 nuclear deal, he said. The reason is that when countries want to confront others, their capabilities must be compatible, and Iran's compatibility with America and Israel means that Iran must have nuclear weapons. In a climate where Russia has attacked Ukraine and Israel has attacked Gaza, and Iran is a staunch supporter of the resistance front, it is natural for the containment system to require that Iran possess nuclear bombs. However, whether Iran declares it is another is another matter, uh, said the politician. So this post on X is, uh, it's incorrect. This is not an actual quote. Uh, it's paraphrasing and it's kind of misconstruing what he said. He said that in his opinion, Iran has nuclear weapons and, um, they just haven't announced it. So this is why it's important not to just like take posts like this at face value. And I, I try and do my best with that. Um, so it was close, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't accurate, but if it's true, then that's interesting. And who knows what implications that'll have for this next attack. Now, if we go to the Institute for the Study of War, uh, they say this, Iran is likely considering its ability to maintain nuclear deterrence against Israel as it plans its retaliatory strike against Israel. Iranian nuclear deterrence against Israel most likely requires that Iran demonstrate a reasonable ability to strike Israeli territory with a delivery device capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. Iran's April 2024 attack on Israel demonstrated it is not capable of effectively penetrating Israel's air defenses. The Iranians may shape this attack deliberately to try to establish that they can, indeed, get a nuclear-capable missile to a target in Israel. That course of action would require strike planning to focus on ensuring that the ballistic missiles succeeded in hitting at least some of their targets it will not be satisfied if only drones or small missiles penetrated Israeli and partner air and missile defenses. So, yeah, that might be an incentive for them to be more successful this time. Beyond just carrying out a, a retaliatory strike um, in revenge of what happened to Hania, uh, they may need to do this in order to prove that they can, in fact, hit Israel with um, a delivery system that is capable of, of delivering nuclear weapons. So it seems like there's a lot riding on this attack for, for Iran, a lot. Um, and this is just right now catching my eye. Uh, anonymous Western intelligence sources told Sky News Arabia that Iran and Lebanese Hezbollah may attack Israel on the Jewish holiday Tisha B'Av, on August 12th to 13th in retaliation for Israel killing Ismail Haniyeh. Yeah, and then it says why. Uh, we've talked about Tisha B'Av quite a few times. Tisha B'Av commemorates the destruction of the first and second temples and is widely considered a day of sadness and tragedy. Yeah, they also, uh, Jew Jewish tradition holds that Tisha B'Av uh, is also the day that other tragedies in, in Jewish history have occurred. And there has been this pattern of you know, attacking Israel on Jewish holidays. You had the Yom Kippur War that happened on the holiest day on the Hebrew calendar, Yom Kippur. Uh, and then the October 7th attack happened on uh, Shemini Atzeret. Let me pull this up really quick. Hebcal.com. Let's look at the 2024 calendar. So here's today, the third Tisha B'Av is in uh, about a week and a half from now, a little over a week. Here it is right here. If we go back to 2023, October 7th, see, you have Shemini Azoet. Essentially, you're supposed to have these first seven days that are uh, focused on the nations of the world. And then the eighth day uh, is like a private day between God and his people, Israel. So that's when... Um, that's when the, Ham the Hamas war started. So I wouldn't be surprised if they decided to attack on Tisha B'Av. 
I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised uh, if they attack today because today is a Jewish Sabbath because it's Saturday. So I don't know. Okay, let's move on from that. Israel radar. Iran axes plans to attack Israel from all directions to evade and saturate air defenses. And I wanted to look into this more. They tagged Ynet alerts. And so you go to that and then they have a link for their article. Ynet is um, an Israeli you know, media company, a news outlet. And if you go to their website, Ynet, they're the ones that talk about this. So... In light of their failed attack in April, it is likely that that the Iranians will try to challenge the defensive wall of the Israeli, American, British, French, and possibly Arab coalition. If we re, if we rely on the statements of Iranian personalities to Arab and Western media, and especially on the speech of Hezbollah's Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah at Shukri's funeral, which contained very important information. The Iranians intend that their their attack will be carried out in conjunction with all elements of the Shiite resistance axis, which includes the Houthis in Yemen, the Shia militias, al Shab sus, uh, suspect, the Afghan and Pakistani Shia militias living in Syria, the Revolutionary Guards located in Syria, and possibly Hezbollah as well. The goal is to attack Israel from many directions. In fact, from 360 degrees. And at the same and at the same time to saturate the air defense systems of Israel and the pro-American coalition that helps us using a very large number of missiles and UAVs that will come from all directions of the ring of fire, quote unquote, that the Iranians have established through their dispatches all around Israel. So and that's kind of what I've been expecting. Um, it makes sense that they would want to overwhelm Israel's uh, air defenses and that of its allies. So I feel like it's all but certain. It's going to be a larger attack. It's going to be a huge attack. Uh, they're probably not going to be able to shoot down, um, you know, 99.9% of all the missiles like they that like they were able to last time. It's going to be bigger. Um and if that's the case, and if they cause significant damage, it's probably just going to escalate things, and it's probably going to lead to some kind of ground war and uh, just all-out war. Makes sense. Uh, this is from New York Times. On Wednesday, Secretary of State Anthony J. Blinken said the United States had not been involved in or even informed of the operation in Tehran, which the Iranian government swiftly blamed on Israel. To some, Mr. Blinken, Blinken's statement confirmed a dangerous power vacuum in the region. You know, I have had the thought, if there is a grand master plan uh, that's been in the works that Iran put together and is implementing, if that's what started the war with Hamas, then, I mean, is it really so far-fetched to believe that maybe they're the ones that... that um, you know, quote unquote, martyred Hania. Like, what if they're looking for the justification to carry out this attack? You know, um, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but maybe it's not. If they're intent on destroying Israel and they need the justification, uh, then maybe this is it. They already have a lot of support worldwide. I feel like this entire time they've just been gaining more and more support. Um, from people throughout the world. And maybe now they feel it's the right time to do this. Uh, we just read that they're they're all willing to be martyred, right? Um, and so maybe the reason why Israel, as far as I have seen, I haven't seen that they've, they, I still haven't seen that they've actually claimed responsibility for the, for Hania being killed. And like he's saying right here, um, Anthony J. Blinken, the, the United States wasn't informed of it. Maybe that's because Israel didn't do it. Maybe this is a uh, part of the plan. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Whatever the case, uh, you have all these different countries right now. The United States, Canada, the UK, Australia, France. 
Russia, all telling their citizens to leave Lebanon and other places and uh, to, to leave immediately. Um, specifically, I've seen report or I've seen people quoting the U.S. Embassy in Beirut telling people to just get a, get a ticket and get out of there. It doesn't matter where the ticket is for as long as it's out of Lebanon you know, just, it's important to leave immediately. And then once you're out of there, then figure out what you're going to do next. So I don't know, we're living in interesting times and, uh, who knows if it's going to happen within hours or within days, but that's a really interesting insight that they may attack on Tisha B'Av. And I'm not going to cover it right now, but we've seen a lot of signs uh, that point to Tisha B'Av. Um, for example, we've had uh, these foxes that have shown up on the Temple Mount, which is a rare sight. Foxes avoid populated places, but um, foxes have been have been spotted three times in articles published by Jerusalem Post as well as Israel 365 News because it's so unusual, and it's tied to... Um, uh, these scriptures that the Jews interpret to mean that when you see foxes on the Temple Mount or near the Temple Mount, that it's a sign that the third temple is going to be built soon. So we've seen that over the last few years. There's been three times. And the first time that foxes showed up, it was like the week before Tisha B'Av. So it's very timely. It's like, oh, here's a sign that the third temple is going to be constructed uh, just before we commemorate the destruction of the first and second temples. And then the second time that foxes showed up, it was just like, I think it was in January. Uh, I think this was last year. I'd have to double check. But the third time that the foxes showed up, it was on Tisha B'Av. So I may have to do another video about this later. But I think that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.